This is Bill. Bill made his finances recession-proof. This is Bob. Bob always meant to get around to recession-proofing his finances. When stocks crashed 35%, Bill's portfolio only dropped half that much, and he slept like a baby. Bob lost 50% of his money. When companies started to lay off workers, Bill's job was safe. Bob started collecting cans for the deposit. When the budget got tight, Bill and his wife knew they could make ends meet. Bob and his wife started fighting more. Bob's wife even went back to yelling at him in Spanish because she knows how much he hates it. Hey, Bowtie Nation, Joseph Hulk here, and whether you're a Bill or a Bob, recession is coming. More than 7 in 10 Americans, 70% according to a CNBC economic survey, believe we are heading into a recession within the next six months. Now, the problem is, more than two in three households don't feel financially prepared for one. Nearly half, 49% of households don't even have enough money saved to cover a $400 emergency expense. In this video, I'll reveal how to recession-proof your income, budget, savings, and investments. 11 tips from the experts on how to protect your finances. We'll also be checking in with Bill and Bob for a few extra tips on smart ways and not so smart ways to master your money. And while most money videos start with telling you to stop spending and just save more, I want to start with income here, how to recession-proof your pay, and maybe even make a little more. First is to make yourself unfireable. Unemployment peaked at 5% for those with a bachelor's degree in 2008 recession, but for those with a high school diploma, it jumped to 11%. That is 1 in 10 Americans out of a job, and even worse for those without a diploma. And now making it so you're not one of those doesn't mean sucking up to the boss. There are ways to make yourself unfireable that take zero effort. One is just leave the drama at the door. Don't bring your personal problems to work and don't engage in drama with your coworkers. Frustrated at home, your coworkers don't want to hear about it and your boss doesn't want it to get in the way of your job. Find something else to talk about around the water cooler besides who's messing around with who. Keep your certifications up to date and take opportunities to learn new skills. Look for a list of certifications or training programs useful to your job or even more broadly for the company. Most jobs will even reimburse you for these, and the more skills you have, the more valuable you become. An easy way to do this is go to careeronestop.org, a nonprofit career site by the Department of Labor, and here go to Toolkit up here in the menu. From there, you look for this section on training and the certification finder. You can search by keyword, job, or industry, or use the drop-down list of jobs, and there are official certification programs here for everything. They're all categorized for core or advanced skills for the job, and a great place to find those new skills that you need to be unfireable. The best part is that this tip does double duty. Keeping your training and skills up means even if you are fired from your job, you'll have no problem getting another one really fast. You can also make yourself unfireable by taking the crap jobs that no one else wants. There are always those little tasks or responsibilities around the work site that your boss has to twist arms to get done. They're either boring, monotonous, or maybe even difficult. Take one for the team and take it on. You'll be seen as a team player and someone that the company can't do without. Another way here to recession-proof your income is to start developing a side hustle or a passive income that can one day pay all your bills. This is exactly how I turned a side hustle into a half a million dollar annual income. I started in 2013 self-publishing and blogging in my free time. That side business quickly grew to thousands of dollars a month and eventually into a full-time career. Now I'm unfireable because I'm the boss and this doesn't have to be online. I talked to Brian and Crystal Cecil last year, two longtime citizens of the Bowtie Nation that started their mowing business with, with just a push mower and working nights and weekends. They scaled it up with a commercial mower and are now making thousands of dollars a month from the business. Even if you don't want something long term, just set a goal of three months for your side hustle. Just a few months is going to enable you to save a few thousand dollars and protect yourself from a recession. If you need ideas, scan sites like Upwork or Freelancer to see what other people are doing online to make their money, or just local papers to find offline opportunities. Again here, I'm not talking about a part-time job or something you have to do forever. Because you see, the beauty of recession-proofing your money is that you only need to get it up to a certain level. You only need that little cash cushion of savings and investments to, to guarantee you'll never have to worry about these money problems. But what are Bill and Bob doing to protect their income? To protect his income, Bill looks for free items on Craigslist or the website next door. He cleans them up and then sells them on eBay or back on Craigslist for a 100% profit. It's the ultimate flipping side hustle. Bob starts selling stolen office supplies for cash. I got staplers, post-it notes, five dollars. Well, we're getting back to our list, but you know I've got to send that special shout out to all you out there in the nation. Thank you for spending a part of your day to be here. 
If you're not part of that community yet, just click that little red subscribe button. It's free and you'll never miss an episode. No matter how much you make, there are ways to make your dollar go further, ways to recession-proof your budget. One of the biggest problems with budgeting is not coming up short to pay the bills, but having just enough. You see, when your income just covers your expenses, there's never any motivation to budget or cut where you can save. You never get around to saving because you don't feel like you need to. The problem is when those big emergency expenses come along or a recession puts a dent in your income, now you've got nothing saved and no hope. Instead, turn your budget upside down. Instead of taking expenses out of your income first, then saving what's left over, take out how much you want to save first. This is going to guarantee that you have some savings set aside and is going to force you to look harder at the expenses that you could do without. Between blown tires, home repairs, and that time little Joey wanted to become a skateboarding star, the average emergency expense is now $1,400 according to a report by Lending Club. And so with most households unable to cover a $400 unexpected expense, having to pay $1,400 can push you into that downward spiral of payday loans and, and pawn shops costing thousands in fees. That's what we want to get away from here, living that paycheck to paycheck with no cash cushion and those check cashing stores that prey on you. And what most people don't understand though is that most of these unexpected and the emergency expenses are really just infrequent. They don't happen often, but they can be planned for. What you can do here is gather up your bank statements and your credit card bills for the last year or two years if you can get them. Then add up all these unexpected expenses, the ones not normally in your monthly budget for each year. Divide that yearly amount by 12 to get a good estimate for how much you need to save away each month for that budget. For example, a AAA survey found that car owners spent an average of $400 a year in maintenance and homeowners spend around $3,000 a year in home repairs according to Angie's List. One of my favorite ways to manage my own budget without going full on Scrooge McDuck is an easy one month spending challenge. Why is it so hard to budget and cut expenses? Because nobody likes the idea of having to cut their expenses and be miserable for the rest of their life. I can tell you from personal experience, ramen noodles get real old after about 10 days in a row. Instead, each month, just pick one thing you can live without. Maybe it's fast food or maybe one of those 15 streaming services that you pay for. After the month is up, you can go back spending on it. But the beauty of these quick one month challenges is, is not only are you going to save the money for that month that you would have spent on it, but you're gonna find a lot of things that you really didn't miss and you'll continue to save on them. Because a lot of times it's just looking for those little things that can make a big difference in your budget. Things like, well, I'll let Bill and Bob show you. Bill compares and buys off-brand groceries to save an extra $20 a week. Bob secretly goes to the Chinese buffet after work because he can't stomach another night of his wife's bologna casserole. Now, those are the little things, but buying versus renting your home is the single biggest financial decision you'll ever make. In fact, it's way too big to cover here. So before you make that decision, check out the video I'll link in the description below because the economy just flipped the answer. That extra room in your budget means you're able to save more and really get out ahead, but there are smart ways and not so smart ways to recession-proof your savings. Nation, the biggest problem with saving isn't that people don't have room in their budget. It's that all the rules by personal finance experts seem so impossible. Seriously, do you think anyone is really sitting on six months worth of expenses in their savings account? Or how many people wait to pay off all their debt before they invest? People hear rules like these and they just give up. So here, I want you to start with a goal of just saving one month's worth of expenses in an emergency fund. Whether it's two or $3,000 or more, just aim for that because I don't want you saving forever before you start putting your money to work for you in investing. Now, don't worry about investing this amount in your emergency fund or getting a high return on it. This money is something you might need in a heartbeat, so you don't want it in anything but cash or a savings account or, or a money market fund. And I'll admit, I don't know if there's anything more seemingly pointless as insurance, but it's just one of those sad facts of life. You need to have basic insurance to cover your emergencies. That's home, health, and auto. I'll tell you, a coworker of mine was trying to sell his home. Uh, this was back in 2012, and the housing market was still recovering, so it was taking a few months longer than expected. But he did have a couple of offers and was sure it would sell within the next couple of months. So, so sure, actually, that he let his homeowner's insurance expire. Two weeks before it was set to close on the sale, a fire ignited from electrical wiring and destroyed everything. Not only is he not selling his house now, but he is also on the hook for tens of thousands of dollars to pay off his mortgage. Yes, it sucks to pay into something for months, even years, and not need it, but there is a reason why insurance is so important, even mandatory for some types. This is protection for those what-if scenarios that can ruin your life. One more savings hack is to pay down your high-interest credit cards with the debt avalanche method, but 
don't cut up your cards. This is a twofer, right? The debt avalanche method means making your minimum payment on all your credit cards and your loans each month, but then taking anything extra and paying down the highest interest debt first. Focusing on that highest interest debt first is gonna save you thousands of dollars that can then be used to pay off all your debt. There's a reason why they call it the avalanche method, because it's the debt payoff system that just builds and builds to get you debt free. But when you're done paying off those credit cards, do not cut them all up. Too many people rush to destroy their cards, and, and it's true, those little buggers are always going to be a temptation to overspend, but they can also be a valuable source of emergency cash if you need it. That means you need a way to save them and have them available, but not for just anything, and our friend Bill has a tip just for that. Bill freezes a credit card, creating a thawing period to decide before any big spending decisions. Bob burns his credit cards in a ceremony, then frantically calls the card company for a replacement. Now, what you do with your savings is going to make all the difference, but making your money work for you can get tough in a recession, so you need to recession-proof your investments. And you do not need thousands of dollars to do this. It was just after the pandemic when I talked to Brian and Crystal. They were able to put enough money away in dividend stocks to help pay the bills from those dividends during the lockdowns, and they did it by investing just $100 a month. In fact, investing in a recession can be one of the best decisions you'll ever make. I'll reveal three tips below, but check out the video linked here for how to get started and how just five stocks in the last five recessions would have made you 180 times your money. All you out there in the Bowtie Nation are gonna recognize these rules for protecting your investments in a recession. Just three tips that are gonna help protect your money. And the first one, never have more than 10% of your money in one single stock. Now here, I'm not talking about exchange-traded funds or ETFs where your money is spread across hundreds or thousands of stocks. Here, I'm talking about having more than 10%, one-tenth of your portfolio in a single company's stock. I know you all out there love Tesla and think Elon Musk is the second coming. I know stocks like it, Apple or Amazon have made millionaires, but when a recession hits, bad things happen to good companies. When I was an equity analyst, everyone, and I mean everyone, had a BlackBerry. It was a requirement and how we got a lot of inside information on the stocks. At one time, BlackBerry controlled 43% of the US market for smartphones, but investors have lost 97% of their stock value over the last 14 years. General Electric, another stock that used to be a must-own among long-term investors, producing a 21% annual return over the 20 years to 2000. Now, investors have lost 84% over the past 20 years, and it will never be back to that previous peak. My point is, you cannot put all your faith or your money into one company, no matter how great it is or how much you love the products. Holding 20 or 30% of your money in one stock is gonna ruin your life if something happens to that company. It's just not worth it. We've talked about the core satellite investing strategy on the channel before, and I'm gonna to link to a full video below, but the most important point here, have 50% or more of your money in exchange-traded funds, those ETFs. Here we are talking about those broad-based funds that cover the entire market or big groups within it, like dividend stocks or growth names. Having half of your money in just a few of these funds means your risk is spread across an entire market. It's not gonna save you from losing any money in a crash, but it will save you from losing more than the overall market, and that is something you can live with. Related to that idea is having some sector diversification and different themes in your portfolio. So I'll talk to investors and they say, yeah, I'm diversified. I've got lots of money in ETFs of tech stocks. The problem here is that's not nearly as much diversification as you might think. For example, look at this graph of three sector funds and the S&P 500 stock market. If you had invested only in the XLK, which holds stocks in the tech sector, and the XLC, which is that communication services, sure, you would have exposure to shares of more than 100 companies in just those two funds, but they are all similar risky growth stock companies. You can see here that where the tech stock fund has lost 25% over the last year, the XLC has lost more than 38% certainly not protecting you from a 17% drop in the overall market, that green line here. But then having some of your money in the Consumer Staples Fund, that XLP here in yellow, would have protected you with a loss of just 3%. That's less than a fifth of the loss on the overall stock market. So please, do not just chase those sexy tech stocks, or the ones all the YouTubers like to talk about. A little bit of boring in other stocks is going to go a long way to protect your money. Bob gets his investment advice from teenagers on TikTok. Bill watches Let's Talk Money and invests wisely. There is a big difference investing in a recession versus a bull market, and not knowing it is going to cost you money. Click through the video to the right for a step-by-step -step to investing in a recession. Don't forget to join the Let's Talk Money community by tapping that subscribe button and clicking the bell notification.